The Muslim world and Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world when you include birth rates and conversion rates. Every day that goes by, more Muslims are coming into the world. One out of every four men, women, and child is a Muslim. There are so many Muslims who we would now call unengaged or Muslims who have not been exposed to the idea of who Christ is. Every day Muslims are dying without the assurance of knowing Christ. These are people that Christ died for. Someone needs to tell them that there is a Savior who loves them very much. Each Frontiers team is tasked with seeing the gospel planted within social networks or within families. Recent studies indicate that Muslims are turning to Jesus in unprecedented numbers. We need to be out there inviting people to give their lives for this magnificent cause. Things are happening in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in North Africa. These are opportunities to minister the grace and love of Christ. Throughout history, Christians have not been effective in making disciples among Muslims. And that's partly because they haven't had enough training. One of the strengths of Frontiers is that we will provide and we do provide general training, but also specific training to the specific geographical part of the Muslim world that you're going to be going to. Now is the time for us to recruit more workers. Right now there are opportunities we have never had before and we may never have again. There is a window to which we must respond. I don't know. None of us know how long these windows are going to stay open. This is the right time for Christians to influence Muslims before the world influences them. The problem is not with the field. The problem is the laborers are few, and we're seeking to see the laborers increase among Muslim peoples. And that's why we say, it's too soon to celebrate, it's too soon to quit. He brought us to serve in the States. Nothing's lost. I'm sorry that's so fuzzy. But we, we see a lot of uh, Muslims are on the East and West Coast, but there's quite a few in Denver. And actually, we'll see in some future slides what's uh, happening in Nebraska. And so we served in Pennsylvania for, for two years, um, training and reaching out to Muslims there. And God doesn't waste anything because of learning Arabic. Uh, we felt God would, would have us still be involved with Arabic speakers especially when they're new to the country. And uh, there was an opening in Colorado then for mobilizers, and um, then you'll see what other things we do as well. And some Muslims in Pennsylvania did come to Christ, and at the Sunday school we'd like to tell some of those stories of what God's done in Lebanon and in, and in Pennsylvania, but mostly in Colorado, but some did come to Christ in Pennsylvania. So we continue to reach out to the, um, well, our heart is to reach out to any of the lost. It's not like we avoid. <laughs> We've got other, uh, it's interesting <clears throat> even who God puts in your path, but um, of others that we get to share with. But uh, because of Arab Arabic, we try to reach out to, mainly in Denver, it's a lot of Iraqis. Mm -hmm. And um, then we get to help train and mentor and mobilize. So. Um, there are people that are headed to the field that we meet with regularly and assist churches to be more aware of the need for how to um, reach out to Muslims and we try to there there's groups that have in their neighborhoods in their communities a lot of Muslims and that they don't they're uh, you know what do we do how do we begin and uh, we want to help them reach out in culturally sensitive ways and to overcome hindrances you know Sometimes we all face fears, and so we, we try to do that. <clears throat> and the part that I like that's behind this, this portion here, is we have a number of groups up and running that are committed to reaching out to Muslims. And the thing I like to remember is when we're, <clears throat> when we're in a Muslim living room or we're with our Muslim friends, we have a high level of confidence that maybe there's 25 or 30 others that same week are in a Muslim living room or with their Muslim friends because we didn't think it was logical to come back to the U.S. and just focus on, on Muslims like we're doing. We thought it was more logical to train others who have an interest and a calling to reach out to Muslims and to train them and encourage them 
and meet as a community of faith on a regular basis, and then have them go out and meet their Muslim friends as well. So it's just really a dynamic uh, ministry that we felt like the Lord opened up for us. So that's that last one, to help establish, facilitate, participate in smaller communities of faith. First there were three, and now um, there are hopefully two more going to start. One starting uh, the first of next month, and another one that's forming. So God is beginning to put it on the hearts of people to just begin reaching out in, in practical ways. And there's quite a few Muslims in Greeley, Colorado, and if that, the group, the group in, in Greeley, if everybody came together, that, all those who want to reach out to Muslims came together, there'd be 51. We meet in the pastor's house and there wouldn't be room to receive all of them in the pastor's house if everyone came at the same time. So it's really a lot of interest in reaching out to Muslims. So here's some of the refugees that um, I help people with ESL. You know, they come and they, some of them don't know English and we've taken them on outings and this family, they, they wanted to go to the river and so we went and she brought this great big, um, I've forgotten, they ha they're from Iraq so they have a different name for that. Um, it's, it's stuffed. I can't think of the name of that dish that they brought but it was yummy. <laughs> and it helped by uh, distributing food to the needy as well. And then mobilizing and mentoring. <clears throat> There's a family that we mentored that uh, was headed to the field and this, these are mobilizers from other agencies. We'll set up um, information booths when, when there's prospective courses, that kind of thing. And uh, just tell people about the opportunities to go cross-cultural um, and minister. Then there's several groups, as we said, meeting now. Um, and we encourage one another, pray, pray for Muslims, and, um, and then have some equipping time in each, each group. So, and we did a Bridges uh, a seminar, five week, and after each presentation, we uh, shared a taste of the Middle East. And some of these things you've tasted before too. Hummus now is real widely um, eaten in the States. And one thing you could do at home sometime if you want to try, just have carrot sticks and put some lemon juice and cumin on it. That's something that we'd have as a snack in Lebanon. Anyway, that gives you an idea of, of some of the things we're doing right now. <clears throat> This, this was, um, it's some years old, so there are probably more mosques than this now. But you can see that there's quite a few in Colorado, and there are even um, several in Nebraska. And mosques in the U.S. are gaining popularity. Islam is a fasting growing religion due to Muslim uh, birth rates. Uh, I would have to say that Christian evangelicalism globally is growing faster than Islam. And it's mainly thank the Lord. Thank the Lord, yes, thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly due to conversions, where the growth in Islam is mainly attributed to birth rates. And then the uh, Muslim population of the United States has increased at a rapid pace. And so, well, while we know that there is still a need in the 1040 window, and that's where the largest number of, of um, unreached peoples are, we're now more aware of what's happening in our own country, aren't we? And, um, and the need to, to reach out. You'll notice that Nebraska, one of the, back in ten, uh, 2010, 298% <clears throat> higher than all the other um, states. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Part of that is due to um, uh, uh, Lexington and, and also in Fort Morgan, they've got these meat packing plants and a lot of um, foreigners are, are coming in and so that's uh, partly due to that, and then also down in the eastern part of the state. So, 86% of the movements of Muslims to Jesus have been since the year 2000, and so God is doing some great things. And in other words, more have come to Christ in the last 16 years than any other time previously. God is doing a new work. God's in control of migrations, places of habitations for his purposes. And I think Mark's going to share about that verse a bit more in Acts. And um, so we want to see this as a, 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 an opportunity. Um, Mark's going to share a bit more about firsthand reports from Lebanon, but we know because of the, the, theory, the all the conflict over there, and there's so many uh, refugees, there were about 800 came to faith um, last year. Can you imagine? 800. And um, so we want to align ourselves with God, God's purposes. And you are doing that. You um, have a part in 
in uh, seeing the lost reached. You wanted to... We had the privilege of taking a uh, perspectives course in Greeley about a year and a half ago. And uh, it was, we were in, here we were in the mission field for 15 years. And we come home, we take this uh, perspectives course. And we learned so much. So blessed that we did that. But uh, look at these different categories up here. Elected migrations out. And uh, these categories like to focus biblically and extra biblically and historically on as people are on the move, and people are on the move, aren't they? Their brother's moving to Lincoln, and, and we hardly meet anyone in Colorado that's from Colorado. They're all from someplace else. Americans are on the move. The world's on the move. People are crisscrossing this nation. And what is God doing with that? Historically, uh, elected migrations out would be missionaries. Uh, we might look at the missionary journeys of Paul. As he went throughout the world and spread the gospel, and, and what happened after that? People came to Christ, churches were established. But it doesn't, it's not just missionaries where God is using migrations to bring fruit, great fruit. There's also forced migrations out. We think of refugees, we think of the displaced. And the refugees coming to the U.S. Are, is not something to fear, but it's rather that we should flip it around and see it as an opportunity. For example, we, uh, when you do Muslim ministry, you, you need some encouragement. You need encouragement all the time to keep going forward. And so we noticed in Pennsylvania, the number of Nepalis that were immigrating to the U.S. and living in Pennsylvania, and the number of Nepalis that have come to Christ is amazing. Nepalis would, uh, once they got settled, they'd find a church. And once they found a church, they'd, they'd listen carefully. Once they listen carefully, they'd go to altar. They'd respond to altar calls. They'd respond to altar calls, and upon responding to altar calls, they would get baptized. And so many Nepalis came to Christ in Pennsylvania and are still coming to Christ in Pennsylvania. That it just gave us this source of encouragement that one day this will happen with the Muslims as well. I remember uh, a Nepali. I was working. I was volunteering with with Lutheran Family Services. I'm sorry, Lutheran Ref Refugee Services in um, Pennsylvania. And the guy, my contact person there was in Nepali. And I was working with Muslims, but he uh, was my contact person, as I mentioned. The f second time I met him, he said, where do you go to church? And uh, what's the address of your church? And Nepalis are really coming to Christ. And uh, it just gives us a source of encouragement to remember that at some point, What's happening with the Nepalese, what's happening with the Cubans in Pennsylvania, a lot of them are coming to Christ. The Vietnamese, the Vietnamese in Pennsylvania, a lot of them are coming to Christ. Will eventually happen with the Muslims. Elected migrations in, foreign students or immigrants. And uh, these are people not forced to leave. These people come willingly, but again, it's an opportunity. And um, on our end. Uh, to, to, to make friends. The Bible says over and over in the Old Testament, be kind to the foreigner that lives in your midst. And I got to thinking, you know, how many times does Jesus give us a command and not tell us exactly what we should do after receiving that command? For example, when I was hungry, Jesus said, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to dr something to drink. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was in sick, you came to me. And he didn't say exactly what to do after that, did he? He said, do these things. But he didn't say, you know, when you come to visit me in prison, give me the four spiritual laws. Or you come to see me when I'm sick, give me the, the Romans road. Or when you uh, feed me, you know, give me a track. He didn't, he didn't say what to do afterwards. He just said to do it. Jesus, I love Jesus. He's so simple. He said to do it. Well, what would happen if we were, took him up at his word and were kind to the foreigner who lives in our midst? I mean, look how many people go visit prisoners in the prison in jails and look how many pri how, I was in uh, I was in prison ministry for seven years before I went to the field there's a lot of inmates have come to Christ I remember one in particular said you know when I go to Bible study uh, uh, there was volunteers you could go to Bible study every night of the week because there's so many volunteers that took Jesus at his word went to the prison and held Bible studies one of them said to me when I go to this Bible study I'm free he, he, here he's behind the wall, he's behind bars, but when he goes to that Bible study, he's free. Because somebody read that Jesus said, when I was in prison, you visited me, and they did it. 
So what would happen if we were kind to the foreigner that, that lived among us? What would God do with that? And I, and I think he's doing things, tremendous things with that, and he's going to do more tremendous things with that. Forced migrations in. Uh, slavery is abominable, isn't it? But the, God takes what man intends for evil, God uses for good. Joseph was taken as a slave. The Israelites were taken as slaves. Uh, African Americans came here as slaves. And look how many African American churches there are that are just absolutely on fire. And look how many bro uh, black brothers and black sisters that you meet, uh, well, that we meet on a regular basis that are just really powerful believers. And what man intended for evil, God uses for good. God works all things together for good. So slavery is abominable. It's terrible what happened in our history and the history of other nations. But God, look what he's done with it. And so we need to pay attention to these migrations. What is God doing with migrations? And we need to be alert, and we need to ask God, what is our role? I think this one, uh, actually, Mark shared some of these already. <laughs> he gave the examples as he was sharing. Yeah, these are the, these are the uh, migrations, same categories, but in history. And uh, extra biblical in history. The one that is up there in the top, you'll see is the Vikings. The Vikings went into Central Europe in, as a result of wanting to take land. It was military adventurism, wasn't it? It wasn't to do well, good. It wasn't to find Jesus. It wasn't to seek the Lord. It was to do harm. And, and, and the Vikings, we read in history, a number of them came to Christ. And when they saw the, when they saw the faithfulness and obedience of the believers, when they would take land, it caused some of them to come to Christ. When we were serving in Lebanon, we had a lot of Swedes, the descendants of the Vikings. <laughs> we had a lot of Swedes serving in, on our team and in, in, in all of Lebanon. And um, another migration that we might want to look at is Saul of Tarsus. Did Saul of Tarsus go to Damascus to do good or to do bad? Well, we know the answer to that, but we know the result too. Saul of Tarsus later became Paul the Apostle, and he went to do bad but he ended up doing good. We think of the queen, of, biblically speaking, we think of Queen of Sheba. She went to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and she, there was a fleshly side to it, too. She wanted to see his wealth, didn't she? And she wanted to, to see, see his power. There was a fleshly side to it, too, wasn't there? But the Queen of Sheba, the good news is, she left knowing Solomon's God. Jesus testified about that in the New Testament. What about the, the eunuch who went to Jerusalem from Ethiopia under Candace, the queen, to worship. And uh, he linked up with Philip the Evangelist in a very sovereign way, and he left Jerusalem, and he left Israel knowing Christ. And as a result of that, there's, there's a number of Ethiopians who know Christ to this day as a result of that. Some of them live in Denver. Some of them work, worship at the church that we worship at in the afternoon. Migrations, we need to pay attention to migrations. What is God doing with his invisible hand behind this, uh, this uh, migration thing that's taking place? So historically, it's part of God's overall plan. And uh, there's many times in Pennsylvania, now in Denver, we've been in Denver, I guess, 20 months now, where um, I thought, this, the Lord is in this. The Lord is in this migration thing for the purpose of the gospel. It shakes us up, doesn't it? And we, we look at the migration patterns, especially Muslims, and, uh, and we can get gripped with fear. We can immediately think, well, you know, what policies will change in my country because of Muslim migration? And um, we can think, what kind of country will I leave my children if this continues on this on this, at this pace, or we'll think, what kind of nation will I turn over to my grandchildren if it continues at this pace, and we're gripped with fear. And I think the Lord would have us, you know, without a vision, the people perish, don't they? Without a vision, it actually says in Scripture, in this book of Proverbs, that people perish. I think the Lord would have us flip that around. He's the God who um, caused death to be swallowed up in victory. 
He's the God who caused death to be swallowed up in victory. He's the God that when the stone was rolled in front of the grave, three days later that grave became empty. And the angel said, why do you seek the living from among the dead? <laughs> He's that, the same God who would cause us, when we look at the stats, we saw some of the stats, when we listen to the political class, when we listen to the political class, and when we read the newspapers, would cause us to be gripped with fear. But he's the same God who wants to take these immigration, these migration patterns, and turn them into victory. Like we're seeing with the Nepalis, we're going to see it with the Muslims. <clears throat> this is a, a normal response. Uh, we have worked with Muslims for many years, and there are times that we, we grapple with what we see on the news. And, and all that's going on, and we 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 all have to keep our eyes on Jesus, right? That's that's the only um, way that we'll have the right perspective or or a right um, understanding of His purposes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> God is already beginning a work among Muslims, and He's going to continue to do a work among Muslims, and and. Um, we don't have to fear. We don't have to um, be concerned. Um, you're going to share more about that. Uh, yes. uh, um, yeah. And yeah. I'm going to let you carry on with. You can shut that off, John. And, and we, we do. In Sunday school, we have a, a little video that we think will be a, kind of inspirational. And we'll share more some personal one on one stories. So let me shut this off. And... I think about all the times the Lord has brought us even in the U.S., back to Muslim ministry. In Pennsylvania, uh, we thought we'd work part-time at this, um, this place where there's orphan children, and we thought we'd be house parents. We thought we could do Muslim ministry, we could do the training, we could do the, uh, the uh, mentorship, but also we could work part-time. So we put in for this house parent job, and we didn't get the job, and we should have actually got the job they even hired a Saudi there for that job. They didn't hire us. And then in Pennsylvania, how we tried to do some different things, and the Lord always brings us back to Muslim ministry, and he's going to do something. Uh, I was, I had the, my Muslim friend was in the hospital in, in the University of Colorado Medical Center, and I went to visit there, him there in the hospital. And I noticed all the Muslims that there were on that campus they come to the U.S. as refugees, and they're getting treated on the University of Colorado campus. And I just took mental note of all the Muslims there were, and I went to see my friend, and I visited my friend, and I went home. And, and I knew as I was driving home, the Lord wanted me to go there on a regular basis, on a regular basis, and meet these Muslims, and share with them in Arabic, because a lot of them are new, and they don't speak English, and share with them in Arabic, and have time with them, and make friends. Well, you know, when you have something loose like that, Maybe you'll find other things to fill your time and you won't really get back and do that. I mean, things like uh, uh, an established appointment with my Muslim friend Ahmed or established appointment with my Muslim friend Fadif. You know, those things I tend to do, but when it's something on the back of my head that's kind of loose, I um, maybe would tend to put that off. Well, let me tell you a story. In the book of Acts, uh, Jesus said, You'll be witnesses of mine in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uh, the ends of the earth. And that was, their, that was their commission, wasn't it? Well, did they get after it right away? I mean, they did a lot of, the Lord used them for healings, the Lord used them to raise the dead, the Lord used them for mass evangelism, where 5,000 got saved one time, 3,000 got saved another time. But did they really follow their commission and spread that thing out? And I would submit that like me, uh, or I like them, they didn't. So what did God do to get them to spread out? He brought persecution. He brought persecution to the church, and it says they were scattered, and wherever they went, they shared Christ. And we see the result of that even to this day. I heard about a certain kind of bird that uh, when its parents realize, or its mothers realize it's time for that bird to leave the nest, that when the bird goes on a flight, the mother will put thorns in the, in the nest, and when the bird comes back, he'll get stuck with the thorns, and then the bird will realize he gets the message. I'll take that as a, 
as, as a yes from my mom, it's time for me to leave. So the Lord sometimes has to, has to get through this thick head of mine. So I knew I was supposed to go to the University of Colorado Medical Center on a regular basis and share Jesus and find Muslims and share with them in Arabic. And I uh, tended to put it off. So what happened? Uh, we went to visit a dentist and uh, the, I needed a lot of dental work. And uh, the place to do it cheap is the University of Colorado Medical Center. <laughs> So now on a regular basis, I have to go to the University of Colorado Medical Center and I tell Bev I'm not going to be home after the dental appointment. I'm going to make friends with Muslims. So the, and as I'm sitting in that dental chair, chair and the guy's sticking me with that poke, that you know how dentists love to do that, they love to poke you, as he's poking me with that little thing that he has, I'm sure he's enjoying it. Um, and in fact, the more I don't enjoy it, I'm sure he enjoys it more. No, I'm just joking. No offense to dentists, they're doing their work. But it reminded me of that thorns in the nest by the bird, <laughs> the putting thorns. I thought, like, this is my thorn. But it's so exciting when my dentist calls me and sets up appointments for me. I get really excited because I, I'm going to go there, and it's not far from the Muslim area of, of Denver. And from there, I can go uh, see Muslims. And then before I go see Muslims, right there on campus, I can go make friends with Muslims. I had, and the, by the, the grace of God, by the, by the Lord's mercy, I've had a lot of real good contacts at the University of Colorado Medical Center. So, um, I, yeah, uh, last time I went there, the gal who's the receptionist said, are you, are you the one that's passing out tracts on campus? <laughs> uh, yeah, guilty, yeah, that, that's me, I'm passing out tracts on campus. I have Spanish, English, and I have, most importantly, I, I feel Arabic. And she said, um, I need to get some of those tracks. She said she grew up reading chick tracks and she wanted, she, wa she wanted the address next time I go of how she can order the tracks I've been passing out. And, uh, and so anyway, and I've had, it's called, uh, what's it called? Steps to Peace with God. So she wants the address to get some of these. But I have had some really good contacts with Arabic speaking Muslims there. Uh, right now we're in a political cycle and I'm not going to, go very deeply into this, but I want to touch on a little bit. And you can have in the same church two people, one will believe that it's right to have a wall, one will believe it's not right to have a wall. And both of them are committed to Christ, both of them are powerful believers, and both of them are, uh, are serving the Lord. And uh, we need to read no further than Romans 14 to find out that there's going to be different beliefs in the political realm even in the spiritual realm, except for the foundational things, Christ and him crucified and resurrected and Lord, and he's the only way to heaven, only way to salvation, only way to eternal life, only way to forgiveness. That we all agree. But you're going to find some disagreements, and we should read Romans 14 now and then to get familiar with that so it doesn't take us by surprise. Uh, we need to vote. We need to look at what the candidates are saying, and we need to get involved. Uh, some, you can have two in the same church. One will think, yeah, we have a moral obligation to take in 10,000 Syrian refugees. And, uh, and he could be, this person could be sitting next to another one who disagrees with that point altogether. Both committed believers, both love Jesus, both are serving the Lord. But they don't agree. So, Jesus, the most potent political question in his time was, do we, pay, do we pay taxes to the Romans? And uh, everybody figured hey, there's only two responses. Yes, maybe for this reason, or no, maybe for this reason. Or yes, or no, or maybe not give a reason. And that was the most loaded political question of his time. But uh, I love Jesus. And I love the way he thinks outside the box. And I love the way he trains us to think outside the box. And he showed us there was more than just two answers to that question, didn't he? He said, um, you all know the story. Show me a coin whose picture is on this coin. Caesar's picture is on, on the coin. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar and give to God that which is God. He brought it right back to their, the necessity of looking to God and serving God. 
And I would submit that we're on the same juncture right now in 2016 in the US. We look across the landscape of Muslim immigration and we ask ourselves what's going to go on. What, at what point will there be pockets where there's Sharia law in, in the US? At what point will we, our policies actually change uh, to have to accommodate an influx of Muslims? Again, I would submit to you that we need to flip that over and go the way of the cross. Uh, by going the way of the cross, a brokenness is going to take place in me, and a brokenness is going to take place in you. It's going to happen, it's a fact. But I'd like to believe it's a brokenness that leads to blessing, and not a brokenness that leads to further despair and even bitterness. I'd like to believe it's a brokenness that leads to blessing, and I firmly believe that without a vision, the people perish, and I firmly believe that's the word of the Lord for us. That the Lord has taken us on an adventure as a nation, and we need to seize that adventure. And remember when we first came to Christ, how we realized uh, our, when our friends turned from us, and when our families turned from us, after a while we came to the place where Jesus said, you know, this is an adventure. Uh, the Lord has put, placed eternity in our hearts, and the Lord has placed the thirst for an adventure in the Christian's heart as well. And we need to see it as an adventure. We need to see it as, a, as an adventure of love, as obeying the Lord, being kind to the foreigner, and stand back and be amazed at what he does. What's our part? What's our part in, in Grant? What's your part in Grant? <clears throat> You're far removed from Lexington that has about 2,500 Muslims. Uh, you're uh, quite a distance from Fort Morgan that has, about, has thousands of Somali Muslims. But what's your part? Well, your children certainly will run into Muslims when they go to the university. When the, your children leave Grant, they will run into Muslims. And right now they need to be praying, and right now they need to be thinking about how they'll respond when they meet Muslims on campus. And remember, it's an adventure of love, to love the foreigner and stand back and see what God, the Lord does with that. Our first part is to pray. It sounds trite, and it sounds like it's a review, and which it is, not the trite part, the review part. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a review, it's a reminder. It's not trite, it's powerful. Prayer is WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Under the Bush administration, he, he really uh, spent a lot of political capital looking for WMD in Iraq, didn't he? But we have the true WMD, we have prayer. I was uh, really challenged recently by this, this prayer movement that's taking place in the UK, and in the Horn of Africa for the Muslims that live in the Horn of Africa. And amazing things were, were happening because of this prayer movement. I read some quotes that have stuck with me. A prayer movement leads to other prayer movements, and other prayer movements lead to people movements. And uh, when, when, when man works, man works. But when man prays, God works. God is calling us here in Grant to recognize the influx of Muslims, to recognize these migration patterns of people, and to seize them by prayer. In that prayer movement that took place, in the, that is taking place right now in the Horn of Africa, amazing things have happened. I guess there was one Muslim guy, and he was obviously possessed. And he, on the street, he would often spit on people and push people, and if they got close enough, tried to kick them. And uh, he saw one of the team members, the believers in Jesus, the Christians, who were out sharing Christ on a regular basis, fueled by this, this prayer movement, and he saw that how kind this man treated other people. Well, it got to the place where this possessed man was not treated very well by other people in his community. Uh, people, if they had a chance, they would curse at him, yell at him. If they had a chance when he wasn't looking, they would shove him or, or try to hit him. And after a while, he became meaner and meaner. But he took note of this Christian who was kind to everybody he came in contact with. He took note of that. After a while, he said to himself, this came out after he came to Christ. His testimony was, uh, he told people's testimony. He said, I said to myself, 
dear God, if this man is kind to me, because no one else is, I'm going to have to ask him who his God is, and I'm going to have to, I'll, I'll be bound to believe in his God, because he's the only one who, who would be kind to me if he turns out to be kind to me. So he approached the guy, and the guy was like with everybody else. He was kind to the demon-possessed person, and the demon-possessed person followed through on his promise, and he came to Christ. And they said the great growth has taken place in the, in the demon-possessed person's life, and growth has taken place in the Horn of Africa because, because of this prayer movement. You know, I think that for the Grant Church, I think this is a mandate for us here to take some time every week and pray for Muslims. And we're not doing Muslims, a, we're doing Muslims a, a disservice. We don't pray against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness that are behind Islam. We need to, uh, the, this, this scripture I'm about to quote is a little bit rough because I'm quoting out of King James. And um, of course I believe that King James history would bear out that King James is the version that Moses used. I believe that history bears that out. Come on, I mean, I saw the Ten Commandments. I know, I know what version Moses used. So, so I, don't, I don't apologize for using King James. I just happen to memorize this scripture in King James. I don't apologize because Moses did use King James, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, the scripture goes like this. It's found in Hebrews, I think, 4. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and moral, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. I said that to say this, that if the, if the Word of God, and indeed it does, slice at the levels between joints and moral, it slices that, that precise, can we not in our minds have the same precision as we take in the Word of God and take on the mind of Christ to make a separation between the religion of Islam and the, the Muslim who lives under this, uh, godless, uh, this ungodly system, this evil system. Can we not do that? I, I think we can. I think we, we are. I think we do. And I think that's part of the reason that this church has invited us to come uh, because we do in fact do that. The the religion of Islam is absolutely wicked. Uh, you find in the Quran 100, 109, ver excuse me, 109 verses instructing Muslims to kill non-Muslims. You find in the Hadith, which is a volume, volume after volume after volume after volume of the traditions of Muhammad, you find 36,000 and change, 36,000 and change verses instructing Muslims to kill non-Muslims. But and, and so that's the system we need to pray against. That's the system we need to come against. There's a principality and there's a power and there's rulers of darkness behind this system that we absolutely need to come against. And we need to ask the Lord to, to free Muslims up from this evil system. But we need to love the Muslim. And uh, you might ask, or someone might ask, under what basis can I love the Muslim? Under what basis can I extend grace and mercy like the Lord has for me to the Muslim? Because when I sit with a Muslim, they might say to me, you know, your book is corrupted, and your Christ isn't who he said he is. He's not Lord. He's not Son of God. He's not divine. And, uh, oh, and by the way, he wasn't crucified. And have a nice day. And it's hard to hear that over and over and over and over again. But... I would submit to you that we need to give them space. We need not change our doctrines. Our doctrines, uh, like Jude said, to be diligent to maintain the faith that was once delivered to the Father. We need not change our doctrines at all. We cannot compromise our doctrines because those are life-giving. Because our beliefs give life to the Muslim. Our belief delivers the Muslim from an eternal hell and gives them eternal life. 
Our belief system gives Muslims absolute forgiveness so they stand before God clean and pure like we are today. We cannot compromise our doctrines, but we can extend grace and mercy on this basis, on the basis of ignorance. Paul said in the book of Timothy, he said, all the bad things he did, all the wicked things he did, he said, I was given grace and mercy because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Peter charged those people in the temple of actually crucifying the Lord. And he said, brethren, he, he, he accused them of crucifying the Lord of being part of that. And then he had an interim space, a sentence. He said, brethren, I know you did it out of ignorance. Paul in Athens said, uh, you ignorantly worship this unknown God. And uh, times of ignorance in the past, God has actually winked at them. But now he's calling us to repent. So there's a space in the kingdom of God for ignorance. So let's um, be solid in our faith. Let's be solid in our commitment to, uh, to uh, maintain the, the beliefs that were once delivered to the fathers. And on that basis, let's befriend Muslims. The other day I had to uh, go to the dentist. And I got a chance to share with Muslims quite a bit on the campus. And I was supposed to be my fr Muslim friend in his apartment at 2.30. And uh, I got, by the time I was done with ministry on campus, it, I had some extra time. So I called him and said, can you meet me earlier? And he said, no, he couldn't. He was out till 2.30. So uh, what I did was I thought I would go down where the mosque is and, and prayer walk around the mosque. And maybe I could meet somebody. It didn't occur to me that it was Friday. <laughs> the day of prayer. And as I was driving that way, I saw a lot of Somalis walking on the street. And I thought, this is what the Lord, this is why my friend couldn't meet me till 2.30. The Lord wants me to stop and meet these Somalis. So I got, parked my car, and I walked to where the Somalis were, and I got to share with a lot of Somalis. And then I found uh, Ahmed and Muhammad, and uh, they were terrible in English. Uh, they, they were taxi drivers, just terrible in English. And yet they're the only ones who want to stop and talk. I thought, why couldn't those guys back there who are, seem to be good in English, why couldn't they? Because Somalis don't speak Arabic. Uh, Somalis have their own language. Why couldn't those guys back there hang with me? Why does Ahmed and Muhammad, who don't speak English, want to hang with me? So we weren't getting anywhere. So I finally said to them, um, do you speak uh, Arabic? Yeah. They, do you speak Arabic? Yes. So we're having this conversation in Arabic. And they were good in Arabic. I guess they must have studied to, to get better at the Quran, learning the Quran in Arabic. Anyway, we're sharing in Arabic. And the same thing was over and over. Uh, your Christ is not who he said he is. Your book is corrupt. And um, the cross isn't true. And so I began to give him proofs. Uh, Luke said that there are many great there are, many, there are many proofs. There are many, many compelling proofs. And we believe that there are many compelling proofs, and they're all over, but we have to dig for them. I began to give them proofs. And point after point after point, I was really pleased that they couldn't answer. I just was so pleased they couldn't answer. And these are some of the things we do in our groups. We, we learn how to do, uh, give a defense of the gospel, give a defense of our beliefs. And time and time again, they couldn't answer. It's something they hadn't heard before. And uh, I didn't leave Ahmed or Muhammad with them coming to faith. But I did allow them to give their points. And I felt like the Lord gave me an answer for their points. And I feel like it'll be something that they'll think about. I think it'll be something that they'll, they'll turn around in their minds. And um, all the time, like, all the time things happen like that, that give us an opportunity to share Christ with Muslims. I'm going to close pretty soon, <clears throat> but I want to leave you with this. Psalm uh, 7414. Psalm 7414 talks about God killing the monster, uh, striking the monster's heads, not head one, heads plural, and striking the monster's head and killing the monster's head. And uh, my whole Christian walk, before I started sharing Christ with Muslims, I always wondered, why is that inserted in the Psalms about God 
killing the monster by striking it in its heads and killing the monster. Until I went to a Muslim country, and then I knew and understood, I think, at least in our situation as we find ourselves now, I think I kind of have a glimpse as to why. I knew a man who walked with Christ, and after a while he left Christ for drinking, <clears throat> and he said this statement, he said, alcohol is a monster. Alcohol is a monster. And uh, I would submit to you that Islam is a monster. When you look at the statistics, 1.6 billion, they live in closed nations. They have a response that the imams have given them to all of the things that we believe. Even though there's answers to those things, uh, they have a response they think is, is airtight. And... Um, very few now in history are coming to Christ. Islam is a monster. And God wants to go against the principalities and the powers, the rules of darkness behind Islam and strike the head of Islam, strike the head of the monster for the purpose of setting them free. And I got to think, uh, thinking, how much, do I, how much time did I spend last week praying against the principalities and the powers and the rules of darkness that are behind Islam, that they might be set free. How much time did I do that last week? Not nearly enough compared to the challenge that's before us. Islam is like a, like a, a huge mountain that we have to go over. I mean, think about the pioneers who went over mountains to get to the west coast. It's a huge mountain. And what Jesus said had something to say about mountains, didn't he? He said, if you have faith, you can have that mountain be removed. And uh, he doesn't mean that mountain that we can see from our house. There might be 10,000 people living on that mountain that you can see from our house. He meant uh, a mountain that gets in the way of the gospel. And Islam is a mountain that gets in the way of the gospel. It's hard to trek upwards against it. And through faith and through prayer, we can see that the mountain removed. So thank you so much for having us, and um, look forward to, to telling some of the stories that the Lord has performed uh, in Muslim ministry during the Sunday school hour, and also we'll take your questions. And uh, so thank you for the inv invitation, and so thank you for your interest in, in, and thank you for supporting us, for getting behind our work, and thank you for your interest in, in uh, Muslim migration to the U.S. And, and our role in that. Thank you so much.